Hi, it's Dr. Ogden. In this uh, lecture, we're going to look at DNA profiling, another one of these topics within DNA technology. So, DNA profiling is really something that we're actually all quite familiar with. I mean, anyone who watches CSI uh, is familiar with this, where you go, where they go in and they collect samples from a crime scene, bring them back to the lab. They do a quick analysis, much too quick for the reality, and then they turn it around and they decide whether the person is guilty or innocent. Um, also in the O.J. Simpson case, this was uh, also brought to light and was one of the big issues of the case as well. And you know, you can use it not just for crime scene investigation, you can use DNA profiling for um, paternity tests, for lots of other things, um, including issues that have sometimes dealt with presidents. So, the first time that this was used in a um, criminal case was actually in, um, we need to go back to about 1986, but it turns out three years earlier, 1983, a young girl was murdered and uh, raped in this town near Narborough, England. And when they first did the investigation, um, there were very few clues left behind, but they did do a rape kit, so they had um, collected semen. and. Um, they went around and didn't find anyone in that it really in the first go around. And then in 1986, again, same, same type of rape murder that occurred. And this time they also collected the rape kit and this time they actually saw a man confessed to the second murder. And so they wanted to pin the first murder on this man as well. And so they decided to go to a nearby university where there was a professor who was developing a method of DNA profiling. Um, sometimes called DNA fingerprinting as well. And so they went to this professor and he ran the, the samples and came back with these results. He said that the DNA from both murder scenes, this, you know, the DNA that was coming from the sperm from both uh, murder scenes, from the semen, sorry, was um, the same person. But then he said that even though it was the same person, it's not the person, the suspect that they had. So for whatever reason, the suspect confessed to the second murder and rape, even though he didn't do it. And uh, so this was the first time that someone was exonerated from a crime um, due to DNA evidence. But they were also then able to continue the search. So they kept searching, kept searching, didn't find anything. And then about um, a little while after, this, they, they decided to ask everyone in the town to swab their cheeks, all the men in the town to swab their cheeks. And so they did this, sent the DNA samples in. It was like over 500 men that did this, nothing. And then a little while later, the case had kind of calmed down a little bit. And a guy in a bar was kind of blabbing that he, the day that everyone was giving their samples, he had his, I can't remember, his cousin or his friend do it. And someone overheard this, tipped off the police. They went and got this guy, had him give a DNA sample, and it turned out this was the person. And this, his name was Colin Pitchfork. And so he was eventually brought to justice. So DNA profiling then has been used in lots of different ways. It's, it was used during, to identify you know, the remains during the World Trade Center attacks. Uh, we use it in evolution research all of the time. For example, I use it in my research and we can use this to I'd also look at very ancient DNA that's either been frozen or, or somehow preserved. We can use this to also identify where certain types of animal products or plant products are coming from. So you can, there are certain populations of beluga uh, fish that give their caviar that are off limits. You cannot farm from them. And so you can actually test caviar as it's coming in and, decide, and determine from which types of populations it's coming from. You can also test animal pelts and say, is this really mink or is it just some type of other rodent? But we can also, of course, use DNA profiling in criminal investigations and forensic science. And early on, the, the idea was when there was a crime scene, you could, could collect the blood, which contained DNA, and then you would compare the signature of that blood to the signature from the suspects. And this was done out by running it on a gel, on, on a machine that looks kind of like this. And you look for the similar pattern. And so here, suspect two's pattern matches the suspect one. We're going to learn a little bit more about how this is done. So once you get the, the mixture of DNA inside of these tubes, you add those to these, to these wells. Again, it's inside of really a kind of a gelatin, flat gelatin type um, mold that you that there are these wells in, you add your samples and then you you introduce a current across that gel. And it turns out that 
um, DNA is overall negatively charged, and so it's going to run towards the positive end of the gel. And it also turns out that smaller fragments run faster than um, longer fragments. So this is why you can get a, this spacing that occurs between the different fragments of the DNA, and then the, you can simply just compare across the suspects to the crime scene to determine um, if there were any matches or not. The way that you cut the DNA up into these smaller or larger fragments is determined on the actual DNA um, sequence. And so this is why it's determining the identity of the person, because everyone on this planet has a different set of DNA. Even though humans overall are more than 99% similar across everyone, but among that little 1% differences, there's enough to determine identity of every single person on the planet. And the way that this is done is introducing a enzyme called a restriction enzyme that comes in here and it cuts along a specific pattern. So notice it's CCGG and then GGCC. It's the same thing forward and backwards, kind of like a palindrome, like race car. And that's where these restriction enzymes cut. And so if you look on the crime scene DNA here, it finds two of those patterns of the CCGG. So it cuts that long piece of DNA into three different fragments. Fragment W, fragment X, and fragment Y. Yet in the suspect's DNA over here, at this position across the DNA, it does not have CCGG. It rather has the ACGG pattern. So the restriction enzyme does not cut here, and so you end up with one big long fragment, fragment Z, and then the fragment Y, which is the same length as the other fragment Y from the crime scene. So when you, when you run that out on your gel, you end up getting the three fragments, X, W, and Y. Remember, Y was the shortest, so it traveled the longest distance. X was the longest of those three, and so it traveled the least amount of distance. Compared to the suspect DNA pattern, where Z traveled the least amount of difference of all of them, because it was basically the combination length of X and W, and Y traveled the exact same distance as the Y over here. But again, this would then uh, be evidence to support that the DNA the suspect's DNA does not match the crime scene DNA. Well, that's how it was done for a long time. That's called restriction, um, restriction fragment length polymorphism, RFLP. But we don't really do that anymore. The way that now most of this is done, um, and mostly because we, we can't gather lots of blood sometimes. Sometimes there's only just a speck of blood, or maybe there's just one little tiny hair. But from that little piece of biological evidence, potentially from one cell, we could make enough DNA to then run some other types of analyses. And so the, the process that does this is called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Polymerase chain reaction is where you begin with one set of DNA, or it could be multiple um, copies of the DNA, but this is what happens with one initial set. Um, it is put into a machine, it's called a thermal cycler, and that thermal cycler um, heats up the sample, and when DNA heats up, it separates. Now, inside of the test tubes, you also have free nucleotides, free A's, G's, C's, and T's, and you have a special polymerase that was taken out of a bacteria from the hot springs of Yellowstone. And that polymerase functions well at high temperatures. So when the DNA is separated, when the, it's heated up, that polymerase chugs along the DNA, grabs those free nucleotides, and copies the DNA. So it does the process of replication. Here. And so now you have two copies, and then it cools down, and then it heats back up and does the same exact thing, and it keeps doing that, and you can see that you get this exponential growth. By the time you've done this, you know, 30 or 35 cycles, you've literally made millions of copies from one initial copy. And so this is how you can start with a very small amount of evidence and lead to a large amount of evidence. So you can also design what parts of the DNA you want to, this is called amplifying, so you can design um, starting and ending points that, that specifically target areas that you want to start and end on. And so what we have designed are spe specific starting and ending points, we call these primers, that look for DNA that has repeats, either like usually it's four letter repeats, A, G, G, C, or something like that. And so it goes A, G, G, C, A, G, G, C, A, G, G, C. And maybe I'll have 17 repeats at that particular point in my chromosome. Maybe you'll have 23. Maybe someone else will have 45. 
And so what you do is you design the starting and the ending to cover all of those repeats, and then you can look at the different sizes. So I just have this picture here. Just by the way, we this is the type of stuff that I do in my lab, although we do it on mayflies to do um, a mayfly phylogenetic and systematic research. So you take the... Um, you, again, you design your, your starting and ending to cover the number of repeats here. And so you can see for one person, it maybe has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven repeats of the letters A, G, A, T, right? And, and so you, do, you can do that across uh, site one. And in this case, the suspect matches the crime scene. They have the same number of repeats. But it could be that down, you know, you do this at a different site, and maybe this repeat is GATA, and you see that the crime scene only has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whereas the um, suspect may have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I hope I counted correctly, right? So it doesn't match. So that would be evidence that, again, that the suspect's DNA does not match the crime scene crime scene DNA. You could also, if you had enough of this, run this out on gels and of course the longer piece of DNA would go in a different position and they wouldn't match, the patterns wouldn't match. But we, we actually, um, it's cheaper and faster to do um, this type of analysis, run it out on a different machine that actually gives us a different output. It looks a, it looks a little bit different, but it, it's similar in, in many ways. So here's an example of this is not of a crime scene, this is actually paternity testing. So they're trying to look at who who's the who's related to who and how are they related and you can actually do this so in this case here's one of the markers and there are all of these possible alleles and Anne happens to have 15 and 17 and so you can see how these things kind of line up using the same logic you could apply something for like a suspect and um, crime scene evidence so here's an example of this uh, here are these peaks the from the crime scene you had a 15 and 18 peak for this marker a 1719 peak for this marker and a 23.2 and a 24 marker for the uh, at the FGA marker. The suspect 1 had a 1415 1718 2324 and the suspect 2 had 1518 1719 23.2 and 24 so an exact match. And you can actually start to calculate also the probability that this match this matching the um, crime scene evidence, what's the probability that that all that someone else also would have matched that, right? Because like, just because it matches doesn't mean that that person was necessarily there at the crime scene. And so what, what they have are these powerful statistics where you say, okay, well, what's the probability of getting 15? And what's the probability of getting 18? And it may be something like, okay, you know, 5% of the population has 15 and 6% of the population has 18. So the way you can figure out the probabilities, you can just say, well, What's the probability of this? 5% times 6%, then you go to the next ones times, you know, 2% times 3%, and then times 4% and 5%, and you times all of those probabilities together, and you end up with a really, really improbable. And that's just looking at three of the sites. Currently, in the U.S., we use a system that has 13 sites, plus recognizing either male or female.